What is going on, everybody? Welcome to Market Talks here on Coin Telegraph. I am your host, Tim Warren from the Coffee and Crypto Show. I'm super excited to go into today. It's going to be a great show. This is the show where every single week on Thursdays at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, at least where I am, we're going to go into the markets, find out what is happening, and bring on amazing, amazing guests who are experts in their field to help you guys analyze what's happening. And of course, as the title suggests, today is all about what could Bitcoin's price be doing here soon? Are we headed down to $15,000 or lower? And what could be the effects if that were to happen? I am joined by a very special guest today, Ray McDermott who I'm super, super excited to get to interview. If you guys are excited, go ahead and smash that like button and subscribe to the channel. But if you don't know who Ray is, Ray is an editor and head of markets at Cointelegraph. After discovering Bitcoin in 2016, Ray went on to work as the head of content and marketing at a variety of blockchain startups. And aside from swing trading anything that moves, Ray is an avid beer drinker and barbecue fanatic. Great guy. Let's go ahead and roll his clip. What is going on, Ray? How are you doing today? I'm good. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, man, I'm super excited to have you here. It's going to be a great show. But uh, first of all, I love the last bit. You know, the avid beer drinker, barbecue fanatic. Sounds like a guy after my own kind. Do you watch any sports by any chance? Are you a, are a sports fanatic at any any uh, level? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, I mean, the U.S. Open's on. So last night I was up to okay. like 2 a.m. watching. Um, I think it was Alvarez and um, I just forgot the other guy's name, but it was an incredible match. The kid that won is only 18. He's Spanish. And it was the, wow. it was like the longest quarterfinal match in history. It lasted about five hours and 20 minutes. Wow. Holy cow. I, yeah, I don't want a whole heck of a lot of, that's tennis, right? The, the U S open. Yeah. Yeah. Tennis. But I mean, I'm into yeah. baseball. I've been watching my Astros yeah. play repping them now wearing the shirt. Um, I'm a Dodgers <laughs> fan, uh, you know, NFL starting this weekend. So there's a few teams sure. I got my eyes on college football's here. So yeah, man, I'm a sports yes, fanatic. Sir. Come on, come on. Well, let's go ahead what and jump you? into the crypto portion. Well, oh yeah, I mean, for me, sports wise, yeah, I, I'm a big Virginia Tech uh, college football fan, and then the NFL. I love mm -hmm. just watching some good games, and and I'll watch basketball. I don't watch a whole heck of a lot of tennis. Uh, every now and then, I'll, I'll find myself watching some of that. Uh, but uh, yeah, Not more of the more of a football hey, man, kind of guy. You. But hey, say what? I love football. I was never into tennis, yeah. and about three years ago, there was nothing on, just politics on CNN. So I turned on the U.S. Open and, you know, never had been interested in tennis my whole life. And it just pulled me in. It's a high energy sport. Mm. It's one to one like baseball pitcher, batter, you know, like uh, it's like being in the ring with a bull, basically. So it's a one on one high energy yeah. sport between two people that are, you know, in top finesse. There's very few breaks. There's no intermissions. So yeah. uh, it just kind of pulled me in and you get addicted to it and there's nothing else on while it's on except uh playoffs about to start for mlb so anyway we could talk that sports all day because crypto is pretty yeah. boring isn't it <laughs> well i have this i have this sneaky feeling ray that uh, as boring as bitcoin and crypto have been there's a chance it's about to get interesting for all the wrong reasons and we're going to go ahead and jump in on that so mm. let's just kind of start off with what is your overall view of the market right now again we were up at twenty five thousand. we dropped down now and we're hovering between 18.5 and about 19.5 give or take do you think that we have potentially some bullish action coming here very soon or is there a little bit further to go to the downside and we'll talk about bigger numbers uh down the road maybe over the next couple of months but let's just start off with maybe the next couple of days or week or two as we lead up for the fed announcement here in a couple of weeks what are your expectations for the bitcoin uh price over the next couple of days to be honest with you i think the prevailing uh trend is to the downside and that's been the case mm. since we topped out at sixty-nine thousand four twenty, and a few months later the fed started uh, the interest rate hikes. So, um, I mean, it's a, there's a multi-prong um, kind of reason for why I think Bitcoin will probably see more downside. Um, mm. I mean, Hal spoke today and he reiterated that he will do or the Fed will do anything necessary to combat inflation, which in July was at a 40-year high, right? 
So the market's already kind of expecting a 75 BPS uh, interest rate hike. And uh, given the tight correlation between, you know, equities markets or stock markets and large caps like Bitcoin and Ethereum, well, I mean, since interest rates started hiking, Bitcoin price has been nothing, in nothing but a downtrend, basically. So mm. um, if you look at things from kind of like the standpoint of technical analysis, and we had written an article about this recently, so I'll drop the link to Adrian. Um, Bitcoin is basically what, what you're getting is a bear flag continuation. That's it. I mean, if, if you want to look yeah. at a daily chart real quick. Yeah. Do you want me to share my screen or do you want to go look at your screen? Uh, I think I can share mine. Let me see Perfect. if I can find the actual window. There it is. Perfect. There we go. So here's our lovely Bitcoin, right? We topped out up here, um, you know, 68 or 69,000 looks like in November. Mm -hmm. um, and then the Fed started its interest rate hikes shortly thereafter. I think that was in June when those rolled in and Bitcoin's always kind of been the canary in the coal mine when it comes to um, giving you some insight into uh, what larger markets might do. You know, risk on assets tend to correct sharply um, ahead of like bearish signaling from the central bank. So Bitcoin kind of led off because you remember Bitcoin price corrected and started dropping while uh, the Dow and the S&P 500 were still pushing toward all-time highs, which fooled a lot of right. us that only focus on crypto into thinking that, oh, it's okay, Bitcoin's definitely going to go up to 75,000 or 100. So we forgot that, um, you know, Bitcoin's price action sometimes leads uh, and kind of like tweets like a canary what's going to happen um, in macro markets. But basically, you've got flagpole, flag, flagpole, flag flagpole flag flagpole right and probably mm -hmm. consolidation into distance and then another breakdown so um i don't really i mean this is a daily chart um i'm more so looking at things on the three day and a weekly time frame i, I don't trade day charts or four hour charts right. or one hour charts or really at all to be honest um so what i see here is just a strong downtrend and there's really no bullish catalyst to um, to break that that downtrend. Now, uh, if I can go on for just a second longer, um, one of my buddies that works at Jarvis Labs, he's a quant. Um, one thing that he had pointed out, and also the guys at Galois Capital had pointed out, is that with the upcoming merge, there's the possibility of that being a bullish event because um i know you're a christian so you know when god um created adam and eve he pulled a rib out of adam to create eve right that's right. like right. magical liquidity in 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 my opinion so if you think back to the bitcoin cash hard fork in 2017 uh you know bitcoin forked everyone that was holding btc ended up getting that bch airdrop or hard fork token which was worth a lot of money and that just injected mm -hmm. a lot of liquidity into the market so if you were bullish on bch you could hold it perpetual contracts built up around that and you could trade it um if you just wanted to have the free money then you know you could take that and shovel it into altcoins or eth or into bitcoin so it's possible that if the merge goes down and we start to see these proof of work hard fork tokens that are essentially being liquidity, where is it going to go? People are afraid to invest in USDC right now because of the OFAC um, right. issues, right? People are scared to get into stable coins in general uh, because of compliance worries. And we, you know, we never really know even if, if, um, if USDT Tether is solvent. We actually, I mean, of course, Paolo will come out and say that it is, uh, but yeah. most people aren't. You know, most people aren't necessarily looking at stable coins as the safest place uh, to take shelter. Uh, the data would show otherwise, but I mean, think about it. If everyone gets this massive kind of airdrop from Ethereum proof of work tokens, it's possible that those funds could make their way into Bitcoin. And 
that mm. might create some short-term catalyst. If the uh, if the open interest is reaching you know all-time highs on Bitcoin and it's to the short size, maybe that'll catalyze some squeeze that pushes the price through whatever the resistance levels are now. But I'm not sure that's it. I, I'm not sure that anything like that, if it were to happen, is actually strong enough to break the trend. You know, like you would need mm. to see the price make a daily higher high or a weekly higher high or a few days worth of higher highs on the actual chart. And then we need to consolidate in whatever that new range might be, whether it be above 25,000, whether it be in the $29,000 range, because there's a volume profile gap on Bitcoin from about uh, yeah. 25,000, 29,000. So let's say we could clear that cluster and then consolidate there for some time and then begin to work our way back up. But I mean, that's, that's literally just hypothetical. Aside from that one hypothetical kind of idea, I personally do not see any macro reason for Bitcoin to consolidate or break out of its current downtrend. Hmm. Yeah, no, actually, what you're talking about right there, I think it'd be interesting for the viewers to see. Go ahead and go to the, the Zoom call. I shared my screen here. Um, right. we, you know, there, there, the VRVP, the volume range profile, uh, vol mm -hmm. uh, the, the visible range vo uh, volume profile, there's got a lot of gaps in here. And I actually was talking with, uh, you know, people around Coffee and Crypto this morning about it. The different holes we have, you know, shorter time frame, there's a little bit of a gap right here around 19.6, 19.5, where this former level of flat support was over the last couple of days. And then you start to get into the real big meat of all the volume right here. And then there's a little bit of a gap right around 20,800. And then you have even more when you hit the, the peak of what we've been in ever since back here in, in early June. And then as you mentioned, there's a dip before 23,000 and then another one before 25. But there's a lot of there's a lot of hurdles. And you can now go off my screen here. You, there's a lot of hurdles for Bitcoin, even if it does start some bullish momentum, a lot of different levels where potentially you might see someone who is taking a long take profit and not pushing anymore to the upside or even better uh, bears who are just sitting there waiting for a good short entry. And uh, there's a, and it's not just one or two. There's like several before we even can talk about twenty five thousand again. Yeah, and price hasn't been able to clear the descending uh, resistance line. So if you draw a trend line from all time high all the way to where price is now on the daily time frame, the price has mm. never been able to push above that resistance level. Um, each time, that's where the bull, the bear flag continuation basically taps that resistance. The last time it was it was at like twenty five thousand three hundred. It taps that resistance level. Um, the bear flag breaks down and yeah. Uh, we end up legging them. So, yeah, I, I just, I mean, Bitcoin um, to me is in an accumulation zone right now. It's time to dollar cost average into the asset. Um, people should be thinking about the upcoming halving and, um, you know, those sort of things rather than trying to day trade Bitcoin with leverage. Um, I personally don't think it's time to ape into Bitcoin. If we dip below 19,000, like we did this week, if we dip below the swing low at 17,800, if we drop to 15,000 or even to 11,000, uh, if, if you're a cash flush, perhaps in the $10,000 range, that could be a place where one starts thinking about purchasing entire coins. Um, but I think, you know, given that the, uh, the price action is basically to the downside, the smarter thing to do is just to kind of average in slowly or hold on to your powder and wait until we kind of, it, until it's clear that we've hit a bottom and entered a phase of consolidation and then start easing in. And you know what consolidation looks like is flat range bound uh, trading, just like from 2018 to 2020, the price was basically, you could put a ruler on the candles on a daily chart and the price follows it in a straight line. Um, and you should look for volume to be increasing on a daily or a weekly kind of time frame as that consolidation takes place. And there's also a lot of on-chain metrics um, that can give investors insight into whether or not, you know, um, it's time to start accumulating.
Wow, that's really good. You know, something you said right there, and let's go ahead and jump into that, is potential macro price bottoms for Bitcoin. And it's, let's start with 15000 because I know that you have a lot of relationships with people who are in the mining world. What would happen to Bitcoin miners that would affect the price pretty significantly if that Bitcoin price did fall as far as 15000 We actually just held a Twitter Spaces. Um, oh, wait, there we go. Sorry, Adrian's telling me to move my laptop back a little bit. So um, <laughs> we actually held a Twitter Spaces last week with an analyst, uh, Colin Harper from Luxar Mining, um, who run a pool, and then uh, Joe Burnett from Blockware Solutions, who I think they provide co-location services, and uh, they also mm -hmm. kind of help people set up. They, they are an industrial Bitcoin miner, so they help people set that up. So I had a chat with them last week, and both of them said, you know, 15,000 would pretty much be um, where many miners are looking at breaking even um, and starting to fall out of profitability. But there is not really a hard, fast um, metric on that because cost of production varies depending on um, miners, you know, cost of electricity per kilowatt. We could say the average is uh, seven cents USD per kilowatt, but there are people that are using renewables um, that are all the way down to four cents per kilowatt. Um, there's guys that are using like flared gas, um, you know, like flaring from um, uh, oil production or like there, there's people that are flaring um, liquid natural gas. So they're using that to power generators um, that are then providing the power for Bitcoin miners. So their cost of production is zero. You know, they're capturing wasted energy and using it to create Bitcoin. Um, so in that instance, like for them, they're agnostic to Bitcoin price because they're essentially producing it for free. Uh, but what you might see happen if Bitcoin price drops to 15,000 or below stays in that range, let's say for two, three, four weeks, what you might see happening is um, smaller or even larger miners um, start to struggle with like debt. And some of them might start turning off their machines. So there's less hash rate that's online. Um, you know, those sort of things could happen. You, you might see liquidation of um, certain like AS ASICs, so different Bitcoin mining machines and equipment. Um, might go on liquidation sale, but um, price dropping to 15,000 doesn't like blow up the mining industry. It, it doesn't kill them. They're not going away. It's, it's a Darwinian type of thing. So the strongest miners survive. Those that can secure the cheapest electricity are the ones that will thrive. So you'll probably see more mergers and acquisitions take place. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Bitcoin mining is going to move wherever cheap electricity is. So China banned it and it came to America, right? Uh, I mean, it's already here, but our dominance of that industry increased. Uh, Europe is going through a kind of crazy energy crisis right now. Um, and, you know, winter is going to be quite cold for them, literally speaking, uh, mm -hmm. for people in their homes. So, you know, the mining industry, whatever exists over there, it's either shutting off or it's moving, you know, it's moving over to the west or further east. Uh, Africa is an untapped gold mine and parts of the Middle East are also kind of untapped when it comes to really low electricity. So if some calamity happened in the United States where Bitcoin mining was no longer, um, you know, uh, profitable or favorable here, then you could see those that have the funds shift back into mm. Africa. Uh, and into the Middle East, so on and so forth. So, yeah, it's it's Interesting. it's uh, a bit silly to say that you know if Bitcoin drops to a certain price, mm -hmm. miners are going to get completely liquidated and and shut down. There will probably be another capitulation, like there was in I think in June when price dropped uh, below twenty thousand. Yeah. A lot of miners capitulated, and uh, Charles Charles Edwards, uh, his hash bands or hash ribbons on chain metric kind of shows that. Um, and mm. his, his chart kind of shows right now that price is capitulating also for miners. 
Wow. You know, speaking of miners, and, and you know, I want to transition us to begin to talk about Ethereum, but going to stay a little bit with Bitcoin for a second. So, of course, Ethereum is switching from proof of work to proof of stake. There will no longer be miners. There'll be stakers. That has caused a lot of unrest in the mining community of people who are making some pretty good money mining Ethereum. My question for you, with your relationship with miners, do you think that miners who were mining Ethereum will just hang up their shoes, say, all right, that's it, I'm done. Do you think they'll navigate potentially over to Bitcoin? Or we've also seen, it looks like a lot of miners are moving towards a project called Ergo, and it's having a massive uptick in price due to it. What do you think the future looks like for former Ethereum miners? Again, of those three options, or maybe another one I'm not thinking of, do you think they're moving to Bitcoin, maybe another altcoin, or are they just going and going to sell their computers and uh, find different work? I'm not exactly sure, and there's a lot of theories out there, and, you know, Three weeks ago, there had been a ton of kind of conversation between actual miners uh, on Twitter and in Telegram groups and all that. And it was impacting, you know, Ethereum price because we were like, you know, yeah. major mining pools are going to hard fork and are going to refuse to to merge. Da, 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 da. So all that's kind of died down, which I found interesting. Something must be happening behind the scenes. Maybe they, they're confederating or they've had some some, you know, like meeting to uh to kind of tamp down the fud a little bit so i'm not exactly sure what happens uh or what will happen but i imagine that for many people who have been mining ethereum for a long time the gears paid off right and um gpu prices aren't really attractive they've crumbled and they will continue to crumble as merge happens, right? Unless the merge is a debacle or it gets delayed at the last minute for some reason. Um, meanwhile, ASICs that are capable of mining on, you know, Ethereum Classic or Ethereum, uh, the prices are still sky high there. So um, one thing that we could see happen possibly is maybe um, Ethereum miners hop over to ETC and just mine there. If you think about mining, it's not something where you need to be a zealot and um, purely dedicated in an ideological sense to that one coin, right? Uh, for example, Kadena. I don't know what the hell Kadena does. I know they have a $100 million grant to develop an ecosystem. They just launched some DeFi product. But I mean, from a fundamental analysis point of view, Kadena doesn't necessarily look like a good investment to me, buying that token, because I don't know what it does. And it's relatively young and new. But from the perspective of mining, I will mine the heck out of Kadena because it produces money, you know? And I can dump Kadena on KuCoin or other deeply liquid markets and use it to buy spot Bitcoin, right? Or I can dump Kadena or I can dump ETC, or I can dump LTC, or I can dump Zcash if I'm mining any of those and use it to average into Bitcoin or to cover my operational cost uh, of mining Bitcoin if I'm running ASICs or hosting them somewhere. So, you know, for Ethereum miners, I imagine that their gear is paid off. For that reason, there's no reason for them to sell their gear uh, and there's no premium on that gear right now, right? Like if I can hop onto another chain and mine, whether or not that chain is fundamentally sound, ETC has no dApps on it, right? ETC is relatively inactive. ETC doesn't, um, it, it pales in comparison to Ethereum in terms of utility, but mining ETC equates to money. And if my gear's already paid off, why not do that? So. Uh, or ergo, this other coin that you're talking about. So um, I, I don't personally, I don't, I don't think that um, everyone will just shut their gear off, recycle it, sell it, and abandon mining. That's my personal view. Bitmain also just released the E9 about a month ago. It's a ASIC. It costs like 10k, um, and it is purely dedicated to mining ETH. And I think you can mine ETC also. So. Um, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. That's very, very, very interesting. That was a great take. Let's let's continue on with Ethereum, though. Now we're going to get away from the mining aspect of it and the fact that it just moved to proof of stake. What are your thoughts about this merger? Not even just for now this merge for Ethereum itself, 
Uh, how do you think it'll ripple and have effects on the rest of the crypto space? Will we see Ethereum? Will this just be a sell the news, uh, the sell the news release here in a week or so, or will we see Ethereum actually start to move bullishly? And will it take any other altcoins with it? Potentially, maybe even could this be a bullish catalyst for even Bitcoin, or is it just kind of a flash in the pan and we're headed back down all the market together? Um. Well, there's a few theories on that, and I just shared an article with Adrian that we wrote about two weeks ago about uh, different strategies for trading the merge. Um, okay. A lot of a lot of things that happen in crypto are, you know, buy the rumor, sell the news events, right? So um, mm -hmm. it is highly likely that um, we will see some post-merge sell-off in Ethereum price. Uh, but does that change Ethereum's? Um, kind of like, does that change one's investment thesis for being bullish on Ethereum long term? I don't think so. Um, now, if you look at like Ethereum derivatives, um, it's clear that what people are doing, market makers and those with big money, is their long spot and their short futures, right? Um, so perhaps they're trying to game the supposed uh, hard fork airdrop that will happen. So people are still accumulating Ethereum according to multiple mm -hmm. data points, right? I want to have as much Ethereum as possible going into the merge, um, assuming that it's going to be, uh, that I'm going to get free tokens out of it that I can sell in the spot market, right? But in case uh, there's some catastrophe or things fall apart or the merge is a debacle, well, at least I am short futures so that I can kind of mitigate any losses that I might take on um, on that kind of long spot position that I have. But in the long run, if Ethereum becomes deflationary and it moves to proof of stake, it seems to be to my benefit to still be holding Ethereum and even buying a dip um, if, it, if it sells off during the sell the news event because I can stake it. Uh, for like 5% at Coinbase or 4.5% at Lido or possibly 10% um, at other places. I think Kraken and FTX and Binance are going to support Ethereum staking. DeFi got totally rocked, but now that it's cleaned out, um, yeah. we should see a little bit more experimentation with new financial models uh, start to come out. Um, so if the Ethereum merge is, is a success, uh, well, one year after that, we get sharding where the network becomes a lot more capable and the throughput goes way up. So I imagine if the merge is successful, then people are going to want to look for yield on their deflationary ETH, right? And large ETH holders, uh, DeFi protocols and such and market makers in this market, which is flat and Bitcoin's probably not going up, we're searching for yield, right? So Ethereum looks to be possibly that asset, uh, which it already was in you know the whole DeFi summer. It was that asset that people built upon and used to pursue yield on their investments. Yeah. So um, there's three strategies that I can think of for Ethereum. One is simple. Just hold the token and hope that there's a few proof of work hard forks uh, and that you get them and that you can sell them on Polo or Binance or whoever supports the proof of work token and just bag that yeah. money, put it into Bitcoin or stables or your favorite altcoin or whatever, or more ETH. Second strategy is what smart money is doing, which is being short in Ethereum futures and quarterly uh, options and then um, being long, you know, holding ETH um, and getting the airdrop. Third option is to just trade the trend. So you could stay in stable coins or whatever your favorite fiat pegged asset is. And if the price action is to the upside and it looks like, you know, Ethereum is going to continue to be a asymmetrical performer in the crypto market, well, swing trade that trend, ride that momentum, whether it be to the upside or the downside. Um, and, and if you are still bullish on ETH, then profits derived from that momentum trade could be used to start to build a long ETH bag. So those are kind of like the three basic strategies. Um, I think part of the sell the news event um, that we might see with Ethereum will be the unwinding of all those futures contracts, all that open interest on 
on Ethereum. Uh, that could kind of be the catalyst that puts pressure on ETH price in the short term. But um, I was just thinking about it as an investor myself the other day and reminding myself, okay, if the merge is successful or even if it's a debacle, there's like 500 dApps that are built on ETH. It's a $43 billion market cap asset. Um, there, there are really mature derivative markets built up around Ethereum. Um, Non-crypto businesses, banks, and investing entities like Ethereum and are investing in Ethereum. So um, I don't think it should be the type of thing where one should panic sell their entire bag just because maybe the price drops 20 or 30 percent if there's some issue with the merge. You know, like I, I think it's the type of asset that you, know, you should remember that there there's a plethora of kind of bullish um, fundamentals surrounding that asset um, and kind of just be hopeful, be hopeful that it's a success. Yeah, that's that's really good, Ray. I mean, something we say on our channel at Coffee and Crypto all the time is that price is downstream of fundamentals. So many people get wrapped up in price and think if a price of a project goes down, that means the project must have gotten worse or vice versa. If the price goes up, the project must have gotten better. That's not necessarily always true. And I think that what you just talked about was a great, great example of that. My last question before I let you go for the day, though, Ray, as a trader and for anyone who's listening right now who wants to be trading more and looking for some good stuff, what project are you most excited about the trading potential of right now? Because while Bitcoin is the biggest one, obviously its volatility isn't as strong as some of these smaller cap coins. What is your favorite coin to be looking at for trading opportunities right now? I am actually interested in Atom or, or Cosmos um, mm. for a variety of reasons. And we, um, we did an analysis on Atom a few weeks back. Um, so I'll drop the link for that so everyone can go read it. Um, let me find, I'm going to share my screen real quick. Yeah. You know, I've got 40 gazillion tabs open. So... Um, <laughs> yeah. The challenge of finding the one that has what I need. That is that is always it. Okay. I always love when there. people share their screens and stuff, and I get you can look at the tabs and be like, oh wow, that person stays busy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm an editor, so um, <laughs> yeah, busy is the name it. of the game. So, I mean, Adam's already up today. It's up six percent, trading at thirteen seventy, and like Ethereum. Adam is a bit of an asymmetrical performer right now, right? So you can see it's trading mm. in kind of an ascending trend line right now uh, where it's bouncing off of that, um, the bottom trend line and hitting resistance at the top trend line. Like pretty much any altcoin that was consolidating when Bitcoin was kind of like looking like it was going to turn 25K into support, um, it's right. capped at the 200 day MA, right? So all altcoins and including Bitcoin are trading below the 200 MA. And uh, what happens is they bounce up above it. They hit that and then correct, right? They either shoot through it and then come back to retest it as support and consolidate, uh, or they shoot through it, meet resistance and bounce down to the 20 MA, or they shoot to it. And we all think we're getting bullish. And then something happens with Jerome Powell or, some crypto scam like 3AC or Terra blows up and then they lose the 20 MA and drop to new swing lows mm. before resuming that trend. So Adam is doing that, but it's still moving in an upward, uh, you know, it's moving to the upside. Price is trading above the 20 day moving average, above the 50 day moving average. We've got that kind of like that confluence between the two or the 20 crosses above the 50, right? Um, so we've got a huge gap in the uh, volume profile here. And what I like about Adam is that um, they are, um, I think staking is like 17% APY on staking. Mm. Um, I think 69% of the available uh, circulating supply is being staked right now. Um, Adam, wow. something is happening within uh, the Cosmos ecosystem where um, they are launching some stable coins. Different DeFi protocols that are within Cosmos are launching a stable coin, and you need to stake Adam uh, in order to create that stable coin. So, in the last two weeks, we saw um, Adam staking rise by like 90%, right? 
Um, it's mm. fallen off a bit in the last seven days. Um, IBC, uh, the, you know, the, the inner blockchain, um, inner blockchain, I forget what the C stands for, um, but that's kind of meant to be the safe uh, cross-chain bridge. Um, and we saw a lot of hacks with cross-chain bridges in the last six months. Yeah. Uh, Harmony got hacked, like 500 million. Ren got hacked. And Ren is in trouble because it's kind of like the uh, hacker's bridge of choice. Whenever a hack happens, that's where they bridge through, um, you know, to like clean the coins or whatever, put them on a different chain. Uh, Ronin was hacked. Like a lot of cross-chain bridges were hacked. And supposedly what's unique about IPC is that uh, it's a little bit more secure and unhackable. Also, Vanek, you know, Vanek's... Uh, like a multi-billion dollar um, uh, fund, like they have a ton of assets under management. They recently wrote an analysis about Adam uh, and the Cosmos ecosystem and, and their view, they see the price doing a 100X and going to $140 per token in their multi-year analysis. And they cited a lot of mm. the reasons that I cited, attractive um, yield on staking, uh, that, oh, also Terra completely collapsed on a lot of the protocols, like DeFi protocols and projects that were in the Terra Luna ecosystem have shifted over to Atom or to the Cosmos ecosystem. So it's kind of the token that was supposed to blow up and it never did. Mm. Price did blow up during the bull market last year. Um, but, you know, all the fundamental drivers of what was supposed to make Atom the L2 of choice or the L1 of choice never came to fruition because the market completely fell apart. So it's like the last great hope mm. at this moment. And what I find interesting is ETH price action is to the upside. It's bullish compared to all altcoins and Bitcoin. And that's because of merge. Adam is doing the same thing, yet there is no merge. So I find that, you know, compelling. So it's been an asset that I've been kind of dollar cost averaging into. I like to stay price agnostic. So I don't care about the short-term price of Atom or Bitcoin or Ethereum. If Atom drops to $5, I'll just buy more. If Ethereum drops to $800, i will buy more. Bitcoin, I, I buy $50 a week via a, a platform called Swan, right? Um, I also mine Bitcoin. So um, that while I'm not profitable mining Bitcoin right now, I'm still increasing my Bitcoin position, right? So... Um, I like to say price agnostic because I think in the next bull market, all of those investments will be profitable. Just looking at the market structure of the assets, looking at the fundamentals of the project and their use case. Um, and uh, there might have been one other reason why I, I was interested in those assets, but it's jumped out of my mind. Well, Ray, uh, that this has been a great show so far. I got two questions from chat. We're going to speed round this because we're running short on time. But uh, if you can answer these as quickly as possible, Rodrigo Pereira said, any idea why possible. Bitcoin <laughs> – he said, any ideas why Bitcoin did not work out to be, to date, the store of value? Uh, people bought into Anthony Pop Pompliano's narrative and all the smart guys narratives that it was an asymmetrical performer and that it was inversely correlated to equities markets and that Bitcoin would become a risk on asset when stocks and equities weren't attractive. And that's not true. If you look at the 90 day correlation between equities prices like the Dow, the NASDAQ, um, the S&P 500, and Bitcoin price, they've always been tightly correlated. Sometimes it breaks and one performs, you know, outperforms the other, but it's, it's only always in the short term uh, from my perspective. Um, and, and, and also Bitcoin came about um, as quantitative easing came about after the 2008, 2009 um, Great Depression or the credit crisis, whatever you want to call it. So Bitcoin, like other risk on assets, thrives off of free money, uh, a Fed that prints to oblivion and when interest rates were zero percent, basically, um, on the dollar. So, you know, quantitative easing has come to an end. Interest rates are going up. The Fed's not giving out free money like they were before. Um, 
So everything's tightening up and you see Bitcoin price tightening up alongside that. So what we need to see is Europe, this is probably too long. What we need to see is Europe coming out of this cold winter um, or we need to see the EU start uh, looking at easy money policies uh, to save themselves from economic collapse. Or we need to see if the Fed um, decides that, hey, we're going to take some actions to help our friends overseas and uh, maybe we get a little bit softer and more dovish on uh, our, our combating of inflation. But so far, uh, Powell has not really even put that into words or thoughts. So, uh, yeah, that's why Bitcoin is not a Bitcoin is money. Uh, Bitcoin is an investment. I believe Bitcoin is a store of value for people uh, who, who are in, in economies that, are, that deal with hyperinflation, like in Venezuela, Argentina, and Syria, Lebanon. Bitcoin's a better store of value for them um, than their native currencies. Uh, but as an investment tool here in the United States, I am, uh, I am you know, 20, 30, 40, 50% down on some of my Bitcoin investments this year. So um, it has not been, been a store of value in the short term, but in the long term, it has been. If you invested in Bitcoin in 2017 or 2013, it's still a store of value for you and you're still up on your investment. So, you know, keep stacking those stats. Good answer, Ray. Last one. What do you think about ADA waiting for the Vasil hard fork? Hey, we just wrote an article about that yesterday, so I will drop that also. Uh, Yashu, our Perfect. resident technical analyst, wrote that. Uh, so I'll drop that to you. Um, Charles Hodgkinson said, um, Cardano is stronger than ever, and many other altcoins are also stronger than, other, than ever on a fundamental point of view. But macro market fears and challenges continue to weigh on the mm. market. So uh, Cardano did get like a 15% pop when it was announced that Vazel was coming. Sadly, maybe if um, if stock markets and Bitcoin crumble as that hard for as as that upgrade takes place, then Cardano might not um, perform well in the short term, even as that upgrade happens. But um, you know, there's still probably a lot of fundamental, fundamentally strong reasons to invest in ADA. Seventy percent of it is staked. Um, what we need to see from Cardano is just more utility. It needs to become a cross-chain asset that becomes more integrated with DeFi, you know, like Ethereum and other um, cross-chain DeFi um, tools. Like, I think Cardano needs more utility to put a, a little bit more pressure on its price. Mm. Great answers there, Ray. Guys, that's all we have for you in this video, but make sure, keep your eyes out for any articles written by Ray because they are phenomenal. Make sure before you leave this video, you leave us with a like. And if you're not subscribed to Cointelegraph, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. It is free and it helps push out better and good crypto content so that we can help the entire world realize how powerful crypto can be for the future. With that being said, though, guys, I'll see all of you next week. Peace. All right. It's been a pleasure. Take care, everyone.